So uh, welcome everybody um, to um, this afternoon's Open House Artists Residency um, Workshop. Uh, this is the fourth event um, running in parallel to the Monsoonal Multiplicities online exhibition, um, which I can see that some of you um, were here at the opening event, so it's great to have you um, again. Um, those of you who haven't had a chance to have a look at the exhibition, the exhibition expands on the research material um, from the Monsoonal Assemblages group, um, and it brings together an, an assemblage and a visual feast of images, cartographic mapping of the monsoon um, videos and text. Um, so today um, we're very excited um, to screen three new works um, by the artists. It's, it's artists, um, in, sorry, it's work in progress. And the artists have been invited to um, respond to a digital residence, um, so re responding to the work on the exhibition, um, and they've, and they've asked, been invited to apply their research practice and produce new work from it. And they've been working on the, um, the residence for approximately um, two weeks. Um, the artists who have been invited to um, respond to the work are uh, feedback Theatre and the members of um, Feedback today are Nina Feldman, Deborah Mina and Nita Pujara. And Feedback is a process-led collective of theatre, movement and research artists dedicated to socially engaged um, creative practice. And most importantly, they put value on the process of making work and the evaluation of um, their methodologies, um, which is as, as equal to the products um, which they create. Um, feedback C performance as a space for dialogue, and I think we're going to experience a bit of um, participation um, this afternoon in their, um, their, their work that they're going to show. Um, the second artist is Sheila Gilani. Um, Sheila is a UK-based interdisciplinary artist whose work spans performance, installation, participatory events, and moving image. Um, interestingly, she's worked with Blast Theory. Um, the Welcome Trust, and most recently Metal, who are curating the Estuary Festival. Um, um, she was commissioned to uh, contribute to the book um, Other Words, um, and also um, carried out a performance called Common Salt. And um, our third artist is Naisa Khan. Um, Naisa was the first British Pakistani artist to represent Pakistan um, at the Venice Art Biennale in 2019. And this was the inaugural Pakistan um, Pavilion. Um, the project that she um, uh, presented was from Manora Field Notes, which is a small island south of the port city of Karachi. Um, and the work is described as representing a picture of Pakistan in microcosm. And Niza's work also um, explores cartography and its links to colonialism. So um, before I hand over to Lindsay Bremner, who is the principal researcher, for the project. Um, I just want to uh, let you know about the running order of today. So after Lindsay's presentation, um, each of the artists will be showing their works. None of us have seen it before. Um, as I said, it's, it's very much work in progress. Um, so feedback will present for 10 minutes, um, then Sheila Galani, and then Niza Khan. And then after that, we'll ask the artists to respond to each other's um, work um, for 10 minutes, and then we'll open up to the audience um, for questions and, and comments. So do please um, put questions um, into the chat, um, and then we'll uh, wrap up the event. So I'll just hand over um, to Lindsay. Before I, we get on to the um, actual subject matter of today's workshop, I thought I would just give you a little bit of background to monsoon assemblages and to the aims of this residency. For those of you who are not familiar with monsoon assemblages, um, we are an ERC funded research project in the School of Architecture and Cities at the University of Westminster. Our core research team comprises me, Lindsay Bremner, the PI, Dr. Beth Cullen, an anthropologist, Christina Giros, a landscape architect, John Cook, an architect, and PhD researchers Anthony Powers, an architect, and Harshav Arden Bat, who comes from a political science background. Monsoon Assemblages has been an intersectional research project that has drawn from a range of disciplines and methods of research. 
in our attempt to think with the monsoon as a material, spatial, temporal agent, enveloping and entangled within lives and places in the region it inhabits and beyond. Our work has resulted in the usual range of academic outputs, journal articles, books, conference presentations, and symposia, as well as Biennale installations and exhibitions, including a partnership with Neil White's Office of Experiments for the Venice Architecture Biennale this year, and our recently launched online exhibition, Monsoonal Multiplicities, which we, we really invite you to share as you're listening to us, to, to browse through as you're listening to us. This, this exhibition was developed in collaboration with designer Jonathan Kane and developer Andrea Hayes at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. This work has brought us into the realm of creative curatorial practice, which the artist's residency we are introducing today extends by engaging artists to think with us in an open-ended way and see where this collaboration might take us. The objectives of this residency from our perspective have been, firstly, to open up our work on this incredibly complex way of being, the monsoon, to new interpretations and new audiences. Secondly, to test whether arts practice can collaborate with architecture and anthropology to make scientific and ethnographic data more accessible. Thirdly, to begin building a mode of practice that combines science, cartography, ethnography, and arts practice as a way of exploring climate change and biodiversity loss in new ways. And finally, to bring the monsoon into the heart of London acknowledging that it is not just something that envelops South and Southeast Asia, but is deeply entwined within London too. Having said this, I would like to thank the artists for being prepared to work with us on this project and for being willing to present their work here today. I've been asked by them to stress that the work you will see is very much work in progress. It is seedlings of ideas, as Mita Pujara put it this week, rough, uncut, and unfinished. And if I may say, it is very brave of them to be prepared to open it for discussion at this stage. Thank you. I'm going to hand back to Karina now. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, so now we're going to have our first presentation um, from Feedback Theatre. And then we'll just continue um, to the next one, which will be Sheila Gilani and then um, Niza. Um, so thank you, Georgia, if you could um, play feedback. The weather always follows the warmest area of the Earth's surface. And winds always blow from cold to warm places. The monsoon is a weather system that is responsible for the rainy and the dry phase that interests the South and Southeast Asia. It is also described as a reversing wind that changes its direction seasonally, bringing about changes in precipitation. Now, the reason why the wind changes its direction has to do with the shape of the orbit of the Earth around the sun. 
So as the Earth travels around the sun over the course of a year, the rays of the sun strikes the Earth at different angles with all sorts of seasonal consequences. The Earth has been doing this journey for a million of years, but the shape of its orbit tilts and wobbles every so often, and that creates long-term changes in the global weather. One of these tilts influences the thermal equator, which is the area of the Earth where the rays of the sun strikes directly, and is also where the trade winds meet, and is so windless that the sailor call it the doldrums. So this particular tilt drives the line of the thermal equator up and down between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, pulling the weather system with it. Because the weather always follow the warmest area of the Earth's surface, and winds always blow from cold to warm places. So in summer, the land across India in the Tibetan Plateau warms up, pulling the weather system towards it and bringing the rain. That's the southwest monsoon. As the land cools down, the weather is pushed towards the Indian Ocean that is now warmer. And that's the northeast monsoon. Swirling above my head. This, this is big work. I am small within it. My body is sitting in front of it. My clicking fingers are the point of entry. I'm sitting on an ill-fitted chair with pillows to support me, temporarily comfortable. I feel my feet in my slippers, slightly cold still, while my back stays upright, holding my head. I'm touching my warm computer. It's overheating. My index and middle fingers slide on the smooth trackpad and click and click. They pick up a pencil, a pencil with ridges on it so that I can hold it better. And note down some words that might be keys to unlock this layered swirl. I hear sounds of the park outside, alcoholics laughing and breaking the rules, children shouting, planes flying much less frequently. Builders drilling, cars driving. My shoulder needs to move, but I stay on my chair and continue looking for my lens into this tempest. But I can't feel the sunshine in the photographs. I can't feel the rain. They went to these places without me. Try it. Go on. Try it. My cousin's face looks like it's going to spontaneously combust. See, the only time I had actually eaten fish with my fingers was when it was rectangle, breadcrumbed and served by Mr. Birdseye. But I had seen this sort of thing before. Neatly portions of, topped portions of fish with tails and with heads, all bobbing around in a light mustardy sauce. And I had totally managed to avoid eating this all my life. But I was so close to winning. We played this game every two years when I went to Kolkata to see my cousins. It was called, Are You Really As Bengali As You Look? And it involved two rounds. The first round was a language round. Um, he would throw words in Bengali at me and I would bat them back translated perfectly in English. The second round was a physical challenge, something that only Bengalis would do. And today it was Ilish Machu Chol, or eating Hilsa in a mustard sauce, mustard curry. It's kind of like sausages and mash for the British or ribolita for the Italian. It sort of speaks of comfort. It speaks of home. So, I peeled back the skin, took a clump of flesh, made a little ball, put it in the rice, popped it in my mouth, boom, I had this. I was gonna win. 
until suddenly, breathless, heartbeat, I had a clear choice. Was I going to continue to chew and swallow, risking death but proving beyond a doubt that I was properly Bengali, or spit it out? Well, I did the only thing I could. Later that day, I saw the elders sit round to have the fish curry. They also peeled back the fish skin, took a clump of flesh, and then with PhD levels of dexterity, working at about 100 miles an hour, started to prise every single little bone away from the flesh. And there were hundreds of them. Then they put it in the rice, made a ball, popped it in the sauce, and ate. No one choked. No one needed extra glasses of water or the entire contents of the homeopathic cabinet come out to save them. These were my people. But was I really there? I felt like a gene had been left in lost luggage on the journey from Golgotha to the Cotswolds. And I was a trout, not an Inish after all. Thank you for indulging us with our first little bit of material. Um, I think what is important to understand from that is when we approached all of this incredible material on the website, we decided to pose ourselves the question, what is our connection to it? And what we wrote in response is what you've just heard. One was an intellectual connection through the mind. Another was a physical connection or lack thereof through the body. And the final was a connection of heritage through blood. These three perspectives became um, the filter through which we conducted the rest of the research period, looking through mind, through body and through blood. You're going to see and hear a lot more from our tiny little presentation because as always, we're cramming as much as you can into a short space. Um, there will be time for questions after all of the artists have presented. So either dump your questions in chat now or just hang on to them until the appropriate time. So part of our exploration, as Nina said, was through the body and we used movement and voice. Um, we watched the um, Monsoon website, we looked to, took material from the website and used it to create a physical vocabulary of really simple um, actions that could be repeated. And um, we shared this amongst ourselves and then created short phrases which we filmed outdoors um, where we live in London and in Leicester. And we also explored um, the website through song and poetry which related to the monsoon and to water and to wind. Um, so the film that you're going to see of our movements has been overlaid um, with a soundscape and that includes a Bangladeshi song by Nazrul Islam um, about a water goddess, a speech from King Lear by Shakespeare and some spoken choreographic instructions, which is also poetic. Kilite jal debi, shuni lo shagur jale, tarangur lahud tule, lila itu pundali, jal chal pule. Nor rain, wind, thunder, fire are my daughters. I tax not you, you elements, with unkindness. I never gave you kingdom, called you children. You owe me no subscription. Wind swirling, rain dripping. Concrete, concrete, concrete. Après nous, les déluges.
and for the very last bit that we're going to show you, um, we are talking about what really stood up for us when we first saw the material, which is the maps. We had to, re we really wanted to understand how these maps were made. And we actually wanted to try and create our own embodied choreography, a map of us in relation to the weather as we perceived it, uh, to the city and to the monsoon. So with the very kind help and guidance uh, from John Cook, uh, we gathered uh, different data for a week. Um, that then from a spreadsheet on number, <laughs> John transformed into the maps that you will see in a moment. So following our uh, structure uh, for the mind, we collected our GPS uh, coordinates for where we live and the place where we were born. And also um, the intensity of the wind as we perceived it. Uh, for the body, we collected our body temperature and the number of layers of clothing that we use to protect ourselves from the weather. For blood, we counted the number of spices we used in cooking each day, uh, as well as whether or not we engage with our own heritage. So all of these data were then layered with hard data from the environment, like temperature, humidity, moon phases, and even COVID vaccinations numbers. And we wanted to show the interaction between these different factors. We also layered this <laughs> um, with a soundscape of daily weather reports that we made. And this is uh, the result. My experience of the weather is that I don't really know whether sun, that's, but it's North very still the right the now. South. Or left or west. My net really is like the very distant out yeah. um, the air and it's such a heavy hanging presence. Quite quite right now. Frozen toes, it feels like we're actually in the right because the clouds are so low, it's just so sunny, so we're passing through a rain and then we're just waiting for the sky is slightly hazy, but the first spring has arrived. But it's really still. It's not like a cloud. You can actually see a tiny little speckle of blue sky. I think they're still alive. Here comes the wind. Can you hear that? So, yeah, um, obviously, as I said, there will be, um, uh, as I said, there will be time later maybe to uh, also ask questions about the map. But what we would like to uh, do now is to open up this mapping process with an invitation to all of you to also gather your own data in a very similar way to what we did. Um, and just for today. So if you can locate the chat box for me now, and if you, uh, you can see that there will be a link Ha, ah, here it is, perfect. So there is a link to a Google form. So if you click on the link now, it can open on your browser and is there. Um, and what we will ask you to do is today when the event finish, uh, to just spend a few minutes to gather um, a number of data uh, about your perception, your body and your environment. And so what we're gonna do then is that we will be able to map all of these different people and map them maybe layering on a global map. Um, uh, yeah, it should only kind of like really take a little bit of time. And so we will have this global snapshot. It's amazing because there are people from many, many places. So yes, please, at the end of the event, if you have five minutes, uh, just fill that Google form for us. And thank you so much for uh, watching this and hopefully you will take part in our mapping experiment. And that's all for us from Feedback Theatre. Thank you. Thank you, that was excellent. I think we're gonna move on to um, Sheila Galani's performance. 
Hi, sorry about that. <laughs> I couldn't get my video working. Classic. Um, that was amazing. That was really, really, really uh, fantastic. Um, uh, I feel like I've had a really solitary journey compared to you. Um, but yeah, we can talk about that afterwards. Um, so I have made um, a set of photographs, basically. Um, so I'm going to trace the journey that I went on. I'm going to read a piece of text and then I'm going to show those photographs. Um, but before I um, begin that, I just wanted to quickly um, introduce my practice a little bit more. Um, and um, uh, yeah, so I work in lots of different um, uh, media. I work in performance installation, moving image, I write text, um, as Karina all said earlier. Um, and you might find my work in theatres, galleries, um, but not also those libraries, museums, corridors, um, the internet. Um, and I work with other people quite a lot, I collaborate. And so, yeah, I think that's why I've just been struck by how solitary my journey has been. <laughs> and I make a lot of social art as well, working with other people. Um, I use materials a lot in my work as well. Um, and I think that's important to share because I often talk about what I do is the choreography of objects and you'll see how that plays out in the photographs. Um, and there's a couple of pieces that I think really relate um, and that have informed the journey that I went on. And one of them, again, as Corinna mentioned earlier, one of them is Common Salt, which is a collaboration with Sue Palmer, um, which happens round a table and is a performance um, slash show and tell and we work with objects and we tell the history of a number of things. Um, the East India Company, the East India Company's hedge, um, which was seeded across India to collect salt, which is also um, talked about on the Monsoonal Multiplicity, Multiplicities uh, website. Um, and we talk about that in relation to the history of collecting and nature and intertwine those um, stories. And the second is the piece of work that we're going to make next, which is about atmospheric forces. Um, and so it's been really, really interesting and exciting to get to engage with um, the stuff on the website because of that. And I have a feeling that I'm going to be coming back to it quite a lot. Right, so I'm just going to share my screen and then I'll share where I got to. Okay. Super. Right, so over the last 10 days, I've been thinking about air, monsoonal air, London air, and the air where I am in the middle of England. Drawing it in, in big deep breaths, making myself aware again, because I always forget, of its constituent parts, its gases, how it moves, how it feels against my face as I cycle through it, make my tea, stare at the trees opposite, look up at the clouds. Over the last 10 days, I've been thinking about atmosphere, that blanket above, around and on top of us all, at the edge of the earth, super thin, scary, and wondering to what feeling I bring with me as I walk into a room, as I speak to you now. Feeling maudlin again, about how different it would be if we were all actually together right now conspiring, as they say, our hearts gradually beating in sync. And over the last 10 days, I've been thinking about time. Climate time, East India Company time, 
worrying a little about the pace at which I make work slow and also how long it takes for a material that I might want to work with get to me too fast. And should I even be buying stuff right now anyway, given all that we know about our warming planet? A knowledge, of course, that reaches back, 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 but is usually sidestepped by corporations too powerful to fail. Infrastructures bound into countries, jobs, families, homes, lives. The answer feels large, and so I try to make it little by Googling things like, how long does it take for the air from the Indian Ocean to reach my lungs in the UK? And who out of the top 1% of companies responsible for most greenhouse gases have their headquarters in London? And if an MP tells a lie in parliament, where does it end up? The matter of it, I mean the molecules that move through their bodily system, the energy, the breath. My eye breathe it in, their lie. At first, because I don't live there anymore, I looked for London in my Midlands home, in books, old memories, foodstuffs, products. Then I did the same for India. Easy. That was everywhere. Then Bangladesh. I found nothing labelled. And Myanmar, which I saw on TV, unfortunately. Next, I searched for the monsoon in my parents' home, asking my dad from India what he remembered about it as a young boy, and my mum from England, what the ways were in which she thought it was here, which made us talk about the pollution in London, which made us talk about trees, which made me remember a very large and particularly magnificent London plane tree in Reading, which led me to trying to find one nearby where I live, far from the capital, yet still shedding its bark to get rid of pollutants rooted by the side of a road in a cemetery over graves. An apt location given that mythically they themselves aren't supposed to die. I also went on a small diversion looking into the multinational Unilever, which was a consequence of Vetter the Collective's video about mercury poisoning in Tamil Nadu on the website. In just an hour or so, I learned all about soap and the Lieber brothers and their links to palm oil from the Belgian Congo before a merger in the 1920s with Uni, of course, eventually finding one of their products sat quietly in my fridge. Then I wondered again how to answer the question. How is London a monsoonal city? Because of course the answer is threaded through everything. London is a monsoonal city. But working out how to show that differently to the exhibition content already produced felt challenging. Such an evocative website, deeply poetic, visual, clear. In usual times I'd jump on a train to London and just follow my nose like a detective. I'd start at the East India Dock Nature Reserve overshadowed by Canary Wharf, somewhere I've been before, but not for a while. I'd sit on a bench and observe the birds at work, noting their behavior not too far away from Clove Crescent and Oregano Drive. Not too far from where the East India Company first traded, just down the road. Letting the layers of history in that space really soak in, as Sue and I lament in our show and tell common salt. And whilst sitting there, I'd work out how to draw lines leading outwards from that location to, well, everywhere. 
perhaps through writing some words for the air or talking to passers-by or hearing sounds and ambient noise not written down in books, embodied research, site-specific, located. But these aren't those times. So I skip those steps and work in my kitchen living room, down on the floor. Sprawled out on the ground, I think about the photos of plastic and weeds collected in Yangon and also the shapes of the data as displayed on the website, spheres, circles, arrows, ellipses. And then I play with some words and objects, slowly at first, arranging and rearranging, adding a little something close to heart, hand that might feel relevant. And so I get here. Maybe that's a bit of a film, or maybe it's just like a scribble in a notebook or a working out of a visual language and form, step by step. But I like something about it. And then attending the EIC walk last Saturday, um, I'm reminded again of Roma's The East offering its riches to Britain, painted on the ceiling of the East India Company's headquarters in 1778 which makes me turn the landscape round. And the landscape, I just want to say, I found in a Chelsea charity shop around 15 years or so ago and used it in a performance that looked at whiteness. I'm not sure whether it's the right thing, but somehow it felt apt to pick it up again, a kind of shorthand for land and landscape in the absence of alternatives. I like something about it. And so I get here to a series of images called London is the City. It's very unfinished, not graded, carefully chosen. It's just shot on a phone, <laughs> but it's an answer of sorts to the question at last or the beginning one of at least. So city glints through aerosol haze. City speculates on sleeping creatures. City interests affect weather and flow. City gulps in air from elsewhere. City banks on natural capital. City rests on easterlies and westerlies. City trades in stocks and futures. City takes with calculated return. And that's it. That's where I got to. Thank you very much, Sheila. That, that was um, incredibly evocative and um, moving. So our last artist is Niza Khan. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, um, Feedback Theatre and Sheila. Uh, it's really an inspiring um, presentation and a hard act to follow. Um, I'm just going to um, share my screen. And um, really this whole experience of a virtual residency is the first time that it's, it's been like this for me. And I think um, the opportunity to engage with the platform of monsoonal multiplicities was 
really inspiring and full. And I think I could spend quite a few days occupying that space. So um, there are a number of ideas that unfolded over this period of time. And I wanted to give you a snapshot of what I've been exploring and the work that I was doing. So I'd like to share my screen. So as soon as I um, began to work, I was asking myself more questions out of this provocation. How is London a monsoonal city? And one of the things that um, Dilip Dakuna mentioned in his opening remarks was talking about the inequality of the monsoon in South Asia and how it impacts people living in low income neighborhoods and housing. And I began to look at historical and contemporary maps of London. And this is one of the first things that came up actually. These were not, um, these were kind of contemporary maps and they showed London through a, across its kind of second languages spoken. So you see quite an interesting kind of concentration of languages and people and neighborhoods. And then the second map that came up was this one from the e evening standard, which showed the posh and poor neighborhoods and what you could buy. Um, the previous one was actually from Savile estate agents. So in a sense, you know, you, I got an idea that, um, you know, a lot of London was distributed across this kind of sense of privileged spaces, race, as well as um, really thinking about also the geography of London as a city. And in the process of looking through these maps, of course, Charles Booth's poverty map of 1899 came up. And this was interesting because it made me think about how London was sort of built on the kind of high and low tides of, of the city and how the floodplains seem to be an important part of London's imagination and how people settled. So Charles Booth was, um, making also notes which kind of pin down certain streets and roads across the map. And you could find this, um, you know, in an LSE research um, a project, which, which, which sort of gives these points along the roads of the city and also parts of um, what he observed in terms of the labor and the people that lived in the city. So I started to look at these maps and I guess as an artist um, working um, a lot with drawing, um, I really responded also to the website and the images of the drawings uh, within that were incredible to sort of think about. But I started working with um, pigment and water. And um, really the first thing that I thought about with these maps was also hydrology and the flow of water and also the kind of anxiety of flooding. So as an artist, I've kind of don't feel rooted until I really engage with the map of a city I'm living in. And ideas of mapping mean different things to me about history and about walking through a space and also about how you know, the physical, physicality of that space really um, becomes part of, of what you're sensing. And this was really difficult in this virtual residency because obviously, um, you know, there was a kind of boundary to how much movement one could have. Um, as I was making these maps, um, I felt like there was this sense of a terra nullis, an empty space which I don't really associate with London. And also it made me think about how one could go back to this empty space or think about ideas of rewilding London um, through this process. So I call these water maps. Um, and as I move through doing some virtual research, I was really intrigued by the kinds of projects that were coming out of London during the mid uh, early 20th century. And this anxiety of the Thames uh, flooding 
was something that has kind of been part of London's history and I think part of the kinds of projects that came out. So Tideless Thames in future London. And also the floods, of course, over a period of time. And the projects that were proposed like the Thames Barrage um, in 1935. So I was looking at this against also the, the kinds of projects that um, were taking place in South Asia across um, canal systems and also this sense of how is the monsoon predicted in South Asia was something which really captured the imagination, a desire to control the water, a desire to control the tides. I really wanted to think about these images as ways as fluid bodies to find relationships um, between um, just the space of the body of river as well as the map. And as I um, continued with um, these ideas, one of the things that really helped connect the um, website and the platform of monsoonal multiplicities was making mind maps. I felt I wanted to really think about the monsoon in London and how it's implicated, its legacy in South Asia, and also the lines that kind of come out across this space of history. And um, the, um, I think in my own practice, I've been thinking a lot about movement of people across spaces, uh, migration, weather, climate refugees, and also the history of indentured labor that took place um, between the end of slavery in America in 1838 and um, 1917. So I'm going to play the third um, short video. So under colonial <clears throat> rule, India's population provided the British Empire with a ready resource of cheap uh, and mobile labor. And in about 239,000 immigrants from India were transported in 245 ships, which made about 534 voyages across the Kala Pani uh, to British Guyana. Um, you know, as I um, was really thinking a lot about the question of um, how is London a monsoonal city, I wanted very much to think about reframing this question 
um, and reframing the idea in order to kind of think through my imagination and through these mind maps I was making and ask another kind of question um, and to bring the monsoon to a more, uh, to a smaller scale that was manageable. And so this question um, came up really in the beginning, how do you measure a cloud? One of the things on the website was uh, the glossary, which gave a number of instruments through which uh, wind force and temperature and other aspects of weather and climate could be measured. And also there were a number of uh, local and indigenous um, solutions to how weather was, was predicted, how it was measured. And so um, I started thinking about this and I really wanted to um, look at the scientific data, but also think about a certain kind of vis visceral sensing in asking this question. So for me, this is um, in a sense, a thought experiment that I want to uh, present as a provocation. Um, and also to just to expand the idea across um, different kinds. I don't know if you can really read everything that's on this mind map, but there were different kinds of um, sort of relationships. I think the, the, the platform of monsoonal multiplicities um, talked about intra-relationships between um, climate, but also between people and infrastructures. And I thought that everybody has a different sense of how um, something like this is measured, how the scale of a cloud is measured. And, um, and so this is how I um, would like to just end by presenting this sort of uh, question out to the audience and think about how um, would one measure a cloud across, across a very personal space, but also through questions of science and, and questions of um, personal history and memory. I think I'll end there because I know that um, there might be things to talk about as we go into the conversation. Um, thank you very much, Niza. That was um, fascinating. Um, yes, I'm, I think from all three artists, um, they're incredibly rich um, and powerful new levels of, of inquiry. Um, and some incredible uh, sharing of your methodologies. And um, I think what I'm going to do is ask, I think, Niza, you brought up um, this perspective of zooming in um, in terms of scale into all the material. Can I, um, Niza, can I ask you to uh, res uh, respond to um, Sheila's work on, on that level? Because. Uh, um, or is because this discussion is about um, you commenting on each other's practice. So maybe if I can ask you to um, uh, comment on Sheila's um, work. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Um, yeah, you know, I think this idea of, um, of scale was really um, important. And I think um, looking at Sheila's work, there's this sense of um, handling material, which which um, which is really important to her, I think, and what she talked about earlier was the sense of kind of working with material, working with objects, and I love the way that um, you know she's sort of being able to hold certain objects together, place them, and layer them, and out of that process, kind of throw out questions which uh, implicate um, you know. Um, larger scales, larger planetary kind of questions, but larger questions of history and how, um, you know, the city of London is, is for example, very much part of, of, of its own sort of legacy. Um, so I, I think um, for me, that was a really exciting and, and beautiful way to, to, to bring something uh, together and especially the complexity of, of those objects as they kind of sit and kind of layer and and compress against um, against each other. Sheila, do you want to respond to that? Because I know you were talking about a choreography of objects, and mm. I think in this dialogue between both of you is 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 interesting. 
Mm. Yeah, one of the words I wrote down was scale. And I think it's incredibly important, like how do you zoom in and out to use that word again? Um, and I, I, there's something to do with the, like I really responded and I said to, um, yeah, the drawing, the painting, um, incredible. And with that camera facing down, I think there's something to do with that viewpoint that allows you to literally zoom in and zoom out. Um, yeah, I almost don't know what else to say in relation to that, but it's definitely on my mind. It's definitely on, on my mind and I could definitely see that in yours. And something to do with the layers, literally seeing the layers of, like how to reveal the layers of history. Um, you mentioned that you were working on the floor, Sheila, and that was interesting yeah. because usually one thinks about the kitchen table and you know you sort of start yeah. painting things uh, or on a studio table, but I guess putting things on the floor, was that for you just to get a bit more distance? It probably was because, and it was also to do with my ridiculous setup in that like, even though I work with this overhead um, viewpoint quite a lot, I still don't have all the equipment. So it's about balancing an iPhone or a camera somewhere. Um, but also it's funny because I started to think about Rangali drawings and also the drawings that were on the website that were on the floor. So being down on the ground, and maybe it's because I originally trained in dance as well. There's something about being floor bound that I really respond to as a maker. Um, and so I think all of that was, was, was in the mix. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I can zoom out literally by standing up. Can yeah, I, I, I hadn't done this before. I hadn't sort of um, um, put a camera above my table and I think it was speaking to Heather that I said, okay, I've got to try this out. This looks like something I need to do. And I think that um, it really gave me a sense of um, looking at the process in a different way because I, I paint a lot and I immediately said, okay, these are water maps. And so it sort of almost became like an object rather than a painting or a drawing. Um, and I think just that finding that relationship between the fluid water kind of um, being pushed around and being out of control was was very you know it was a very physical experience um, so yeah I felt different about sort of doing something that I've done for a very long time in this process. Can I just bring in feedback theatre because your work was so bodily and visceral and something the chats put in about how polyrhythmic it was and I mean I love the way you divided into three sections, the intellectual connection, the physical and the heritage. Um, and there's so much energy and movement in your performance. Can, can you talk a bit about how you, um, uh, you know, brought the, the work into being um, in terms of interpreting the, um, the website and the kind of scale of material? Which head of the beast are you asking, Karina? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll um, give it a go yeah. and then you know, yes. and, yeah. so your question's about layering and embodiment I'm I'm hearing yes yeah um I think you know the first few conversations we had were all about the layers the layers there's so much there's so much um and so we just the most we went to the most obvious which was you know how many layers of clothing and that's something that I think ran through all of those pieces you saw. We were, you know, taking off and putting on in the monologues. Um, in the dance piece, we had lots of discussions about like, what do we wear? But there was no answer, so we just did it. And then in the maps, the, the layers became this key kind of um, measure of many things, measure of how our bodies were feeling, but also what our bodies needed to encounter the external environment. Um, I'll pass on to Deborah and Mita if you have stuff to add there. No, no, I was just going to say that um, uh, just to, um, I suppose, say what Nina said in terms of it was quite overwhelming. It was almost like we were in a monsoon when we were in the website, to be honest. At some point, I felt like overwhelmed by the rain, <laughs> overwhelmed by there was just so much rich information and such. Um, gorgeous research methods and gorgeous um, visuals. So um, I think for us, it was it was a trying to unpack it. And we took, I mean, it's quite, um, in one way, it's body, mind, and 
that heart blood but actually these things are really interconnected so i think as we were producing the work we were just aware of those sort of interconnections almost like the interconnection of the big scale to the tiny work from your personal journey sheila to the sort of um the wider landscapes and so we we were also and also in how it influences our everyday life but also influences our histories and heritages and ancestors who we don't we're not in connection with you know and the environment so all of those layers were i think we started very sort of scientifically well not scientifically but tried to create some order but then the interconnections for us i think um is what i'm left with now yeah, um, I, and I will add just that um, because of the, the the scale, which both of you have kind of mentioned, is what was a constantly, as you said, a zooming out and in, and it was on how did we get here? How did you even get to be here working on this thing? Uh, but what was for me very fascinating looking at, for example, Sheila's work is that we could go on your thoughts processing, which was amazing. It's just the being, and it's so beautiful and being inside your head as you were making all these connections. So I think for us was even more complicated by the fact that we were three people having our own journeys and one was going that way and the other one was going the other way. And, you know, and we were physically separated. Um, and so I think there was this kind of like on top of that kind of like trying to kind of join the dots and see where some of these things kind of were similar somehow. Um, yeah, so that really resonates with me when, when I saw your, your journey. I, um, Deborah, I thought your, your discussion about how drawn in you were by the, the maps, the mapping processes, and then the, the cartography, and you had a conversation with John Cook, and he is the, um, the architect who did a lot of those drawings, along with Christina Geras. Um, can you just talk, and that was a very beautiful film where you use the data mapping and the overlapping of voices. Can you talk a bit more about what kind of conversations did you have with John and um, what, you know, what kind of vocabulary did you use and, and you know, how kind of um, digestible were, you know, were the, what was the material and, and what was your interpretation of it? So it has been absolutely fascinating. So we kind of like went to John and John is here. So John, please mm -hmm. unmute yourself, do not hide. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and we, the first thing was like, literally like, how did you make a map? And he explained to me all of the things and I all these spreadsheets and all these numbers. And so what really strike us was that you have so many ways of collecting this type of data and they can be then represented in so many ways. So the conversation that we then, uh, that we were having is that how, what are the type of data that we have to collect somehow to get a variety of graphic results and John brilliantly did a series of like sketches of like possibility of representation of this uh, data. And we then settled for um, this idea of uh, having a body geolocated uh, as a kind of a nuclear entity and, and all the different influences. Um, I think, John, do you want to say something about it? <laughs> no, you were doing a very great job. Um, <laughs> no, we had some kind of wild conversations, I think, because we were coming at so, such <clears throat> distances of work and trying to uh, in a way we probably got something quite amazing out of it because we were so uh, unfamiliar with each other's area of expertise um so it was kind of in that way the kind of i think everyone's work has been kind of amazing that they've um built on the restrictions of like the global situation at the moment and response to that and kind of placed it in time and i think the, this is the similar kind of thing actually because we were just having these wild zoom conversations but would you like me to talk about the maps in particular deborah yeah, maybe like, you know, the, I can show that, I don't know if that uh, taking too much time, but I do have the PDF of the sketches that John yeah. started with, if that's okay. You can stop me at any time. I think is this one, I think this one. Yeah, that one. Uh, I think the other one, maybe. The other one. Do you think? Yeah, possibly. Oh, either of them. Okay, that's fine. But we thought, yeah, we'd... We'd, we'd saw, we talked about how, yeah, different ways of mapping from the body and um, how you kind of apply 
perceived experience into a kind of onto a larger notation and so we'd looked at the ideas of mapping onto a line or a timeline or a journey or um of, of cycles and we we eventually kind of looked at mapping from a point and the body was a point that would influence outwards and this and the external environment was um would impact inwards and so that's kind of where those so the different factors of temperature and wind kind of become um gradients in between those two environments um and so yeah it was nice to be able to apply the kind of the very data heavy satellite top down uh, information um onto a different scale and then just see what the unexpected outcomes came from that really Wow. Thank you, John. That was, that was really interesting. I'm just going to remind everybody, um, do put questions into the chat. Um, ah, we've got a question from Harsh. Harsh, yeah, please ask away. Hi. Uh, that, is, that's, that was really wonderful. I, I really enjoyed uh, those pieces. And I guess I have, uh, I have two questions. One is, I was wondering if you could speak to some of the tensions between, I mean, that the question offered you, uh, is London a monsoon city? And it seems to me that in, in all of your presentations, sort of you, you, you touch on it, but I, I was wondering if you could um, maybe tell us more because, yeah, I mean, so, so that is one open-ended question. Um, the second one was about the first piece. And I was wondering why the choice of blood um in 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 that trio what why blood and not people body flesh being things life matter uh why why what is what is why why what what is blood doing here um i was wondering if you could clarify or explain thank you nina do you want to respond to that <laughs> sure i mean i think partly just because it's theatrical and that's okay right um, blood, uh, we all have so many connotations, but I think um, also because of its link to, I guess, poetic ideas of heritage and that um, blood is passed from one generation to the next, um, not, you know, not that we have to bleed for that to happen, but that somehow that flow that's encapsulated in that word felt more appropriate than Others we played with heart, but and we played with heritage, um, but it felt like blood just. It also kind of broke that duality that we set up with mind and body. It kind of was a third, slightly uncomfortable, um, kind of third cousin. But meet or Deborah, is there? Yeah, there was. Um, I mean, for me, it was really simple as well. I mean, my family house is on the banks of the East India Company so on a really basic level the the my blood connection to the map of the fish was actually my whole my whole family lives up the Ganga all the way up to the top and down so there was a very sort of direct thing and also there was the blood that has come over through colonial um, labor and through um, through the history of colonialism you know it's brought our ancestors over, it's brought my parents over, without that blood connection, I wouldn't be here either. So I think for me, it was, there was something poetic and dramatic um, about that and wanting to break the mind, body, heart cliche almost that we have um, and soul um, and go to something that was more visceral. Um, was that, was that perhaps? Yeah, and, and I think we were also very aware that we didn't have that connection at all. And so I think was also wanted to kind of like uh, being aware of the fact that um, our connection was absolutely different and, and then kind of like um, wanted to kind of um, uh, highlight that. Thanks, Harsh, that question. Um, yeah, there's a question from Ria. Ria, do you want to um, uh, announce your question if you're with us? Uh, yeah, if, yeah, if not, um, Ria was, um, Ria's statement and question was, the works are all um, moving and insightful and refreshing. Thank you so much for sharing. Is there any way we can see them again? Um, I think that that's a question that kind of leads on to um, 
how you think um, might this work be developed um, in, in the future? I mean, we are going to show um, the work through an Instagram feed, but um, I think independently, will this help to, um, I mean, I know Sheila has mentioned that um, she'll probably keep, you know, work with the material um, for an extended period. I'm just wondering how this might, might this um, act as a, a basis um, for your work. Can I ask um, Anaisa to come in on that question? Hi. Um, I think in terms of um, moving forward, I, I feel like, um, you know, this is a kind of question which kind of has lots of arms coming out of it, I suppose. And for me, it's also a uh, question about the imagination. Um, one of the speakers in, in, in an earlier conversation this month said, the monsoon is an exile in London. And I thought that was really um, interesting. A lot of what Harsha asked about us, you know, thinking about the monsoon in London is, um, is difficult because I, I think on one level, the website is so strong and sort of roots you uh, to think about the monsoon in South Asia. But I think that um, at least for me through this process, I feel that, um, you know, that there, there are these, um, I mean, one of the things I thought about were just proverbs or colloquialisms, like, you know, we're going through a real storm or some of the words that Sheila had kind of constructed in her assemblage. Um, and so I think that there's this kind of metaphorical layer for me um, of connecting and extending the work. Um, but there's a very, very strong, um, you know, um, legacy also of all, all, all the kinds of, um, you know, projects and infrastructures that kind of work to control water, to, to model the monsoon. You know, how, how does um, London resist also certain kinds of modelings on that level of um, thinking about, you know, shifts in its political um, sort of atmosphere. I think about Brexit and COVID, of course, as well. So for me, there are kind of lots of things that um, are there to unpack from this question and to think about in the future as I kind of keep working. Um, also, um, I think this, um, this, uh, this question also makes me want to ask people, what is your, you know, what is your weather memory? Because <clears throat> I think um, asking that question, you kind of begin to get a response um, from certain specific places uh, about a particular memory. And that kind of makes you think about uh, this question, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of more circular way. Thank you, Naisa. I think um, a lot of you have all talked about how you're locating your, your own self within the, you know, within the much wider um, uh, questions and the kind of enormity of the um, of the the project and Deborah, you were talking about kind of geopositioning yourself. Um, Naisa, you've talked about the space between the body and the map in these water maps. And Sheila, you were talking about your um, you know your own experiences of, of growing up with these the presence of of the the legacy of of um, East India Dock. Um, and I just wondered, um, question: What do you feel that the agency? Of an artist is how, how do you feel that you can have that agency in in terms of um, uh, uh, I hate the word impact but you know just in terms of e expanding the kind of the the content to to have um, yeah agency within itself. Sh Sheila, do you want to respond? Yeah. Um... Well, it's a question that I think about all the time. Um, I'm not sure what that answer is. I think maybe the way I tackle it is um, to think about where my work is positioned and who um, encounters it and how. Um, and um, to always, for me, really like in this particular um, piece of work, it's been really important for me to think about the East India Company historically, but also their, their roots, like how they reach through to today. Um, you know, they were the original corporation 
and like it really is a hundred corporations that are responsible for um you know global warming at the moment like in majority and so it's sort of like thinking about tracing tracing those uh, stories or narratives over um hundreds of years and then telling them in some kind of way um and then yeah thinking about who and how people can encounter your work um and so that might be in like a real really like a well-established institu institution but it might, so, might also be like the library down the road um and i'm really interested in uh, the cross-pollination i think between those spaces um and i think that's why i work in multiple languages as well in terms of practice because i want to be anywhere and everywhere <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good place to be Sheila. I've, I've got a question from lizzie sells Lizzie, would you like to ask um, that your question? Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> it was more like a, just for so thanks, thanks to all of the artists that have so generously shared their work with us today. Thank you. Um, no, well, I was just kind of pondering after um, Nice's provocation about weather memory and I was thinking about what my strongest memories and my associations with weather are from my childhood and then I wondered if we can belong to weather um, so it's not really a specific <laughs> question to anyone it was just like daydreaming out loud no no it's a, it's a very beautiful question I think Nisa is going to respond to that yeah, um, you know, it's a question that's come out of just talking to people and, and you know, as I was um, in, in a project last year, I was working with archives of weather history, I realized by just taking this archival document and kind of slowly unraveling it through my work, I realized that it was really a document of social history. And in a sense, you know, what you're saying is is really beautiful that can you be part of you know a weather memory can you inhabit it and um i i as i um asked people around me um about a certain um you know place then the first thing they would say would be a, a very strong memory about whether whether it was a monsoon in in chittagong or um or somewhere else and i think you know this question um of inhabiting that space is, is really important because it's through your, it's through the kind of emotional connection that you get somewhere. Um, and I, I think I wanted to tap that emotional energy um, by asking that question of people. So, yeah. Um, Misha, do you want to respond to that question? Are your mics off, Mita? <laughs> I've joined you, Lizzie, on a daydream now, um, thinking about myself in loads of different weather. Um, can I belong to the weather? I was, I'm thinking about how we, like that idea of when you, when an object changes or when someone goes into a space, how we affect the place that we're in. So I've sort of gone off into a dream around that idea and how me standing in my garden measuring perceiving the weather in a super subjective way because none of this is um sort of measure other than our body temperature nothing that i don't know um can we belong to the weather i don't know i can't really answer that. I'm, I'm still in the middle of my reverie but if i do come out of it i'll pop it in the chat box sheila do you want to respond to that and also nina has asked the question because you were talking about um trees and i um nina's ask where do you think you might go with that so sorry that's two questions one about the weather, weather memories feeling the weather and the other one um because you talked about the london plane tree mm. yeah and it was one of the first places that i went to so i asked my dad about the monsoon um so yeah instinctively i think that seemed um yeah you're just you yeah it, it, it was another form of data to collect i suppose um and trees, I mean, I've made work about trees before um, as part of Rambles with Nature. 
and um, again, yeah, I'll definitely be going back to that, to them. In a way, it sort of feels like um, you could pick up anything and work out um, the history that surrounds it and tell your story through that. So like it could be a tree. And so the tree might link back to um, the boats that the East India Company um, built, you know, the actual material that they built from. Um, but it might be, uh, yeah, and it might be this pencil um, or it might be that I could um, pick up a cup and talk about, I don't know, anything, I suppose. So um, I talked about the London plane tree because I think for atmospheric forces, the work that I'm making with Sue, um, we're probably gonna um, make some work under a, a, a tree maybe. But yes, then pull it into kind of all these different histories because it is linked into everything. You know, it's breathing in air. Um, it's rooted in the ground. It's watching over everything we do. Um, and it's a material, it's wood, it's used everywhere. It's absolutely interlinked, um, yeah. Thanks, Sheila. Um, there's a question from Harsh um, and from Nina. Nina, is your question following on from Sheila's comment? Yeah, sorry, yes, sorry. I, I, think I didn't express myself very well in, in the chat, Sheila, but I've, I've probably got this partly wrong. But anyway, I've recently learned about the London plane tree and how you know, basically its skin is tougher than all others and so doesn't absorb all the pollution that killed off so many of the other trees that were in London around the, the kind of the times of the smog, etc. And I just think that that's this really fascinating other layer to that tree of like, not that the atmosphere can't penetrate it. Mm. Um, it's interesting because, um, but then Sue, yeah, that's exactly what I think and read about but I do remember Sue who I collaborate with a lot saying that actually it's not true but I never actually managed to talk to her about it so <laughs> I'll have to follow that up at another another point and um, I think it sheds it sheds its bark to get rid of the pollutants but it might be just doing that like any other tree um, but I'd have to I feel like I need to go and talk to an expert about it. <laughs> Thanks Sheila. Ag uh, Harsh do ask you a question. Uh, thanks once again. Uh, I, I um, obviously there's there's this force of uh, diasporic mobility, uh, migrations, um, and movements of people and consumption and, and culture. Um, but I guess the way I want to build on the the questions that were just asked is. Does the centering of London exist in your works when the monsoon is not the monsoon? Because the assumption that a lot of us share, and I'm with you on this, is that the monsoon is a global weather system and that the monsoon is a figuration. Um, and so if the monsoon as a word and an artifact does not exist, and if that theoretical construct does not exist, uh, if there are many, many, many weathers, uh, what happens to the production of our identities and stories? And is the pickle in the, um, in the, in the fridge that Sheila spoke of and the, the financial map or the photograph, the, the, the collection of objects and organization, how much do these stories change if this one single um, you know, collection of words is removed from that cosmology. And what does that do for your stories? I guess that is my question also for blood because, yeah, I mean, anyway, not, not to dig into that further, but, but just, to, just to explain where I'm coming from. Thanks. Who would like to respond to that? Very um, rich question, Harsh. I'll have a go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Um, you know, my first response is that um, this provocation, how is London a monsoonal city? I think the word monsoon carries a lot of um, baggage. 
And so uh, I think perhaps it is redundant in some ways, as you've suggested, that it doesn't really necessarily it could be replaced by something else, which is why I was questioning this idea of, you know, how do you measure the monsoon or how do you measure a cloud? So I was trying to bring it down to scale. But I think being positioned in London and again, coming back to your question, um, has been really important uh, for me because um, and just drawing those maps of the city of London were really important through that process of water and kind of flooding the page. Um, I, I can't really pin it down to why it was important, but um, I think that positionality is really critical. Um, and, uh, you know, asking this question, sitting in London as an artist, asking this question has um, a, a very particular um, and critical kind of um, space um, for what I'm thinking about and and how the website and the platform has 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 been there to engage with because it's been kind of locked down but at the same time I've been really immersed in that in that platform so you know I think that kind of relationship with geography has done something by sitting here I don't think I could do the same work sitting um, in Karachi or Dhaka or Chennai. Sorry, not to answer your question completely, but just a bit. Thanks, Niza. Yeah, I think that also, because last week there was the, the walking tour, um, the East India dot walking tour, but that was all online. So it felt very close, but oddly removed as well. I want to, Sheila, you, you work a lot with words, um, you know, very beautifully kind of composed words and word play and um, sort of a build up of a, of a narrative feeding into the questions you were asking. Do, can, do you want to respond to Harsh's um, question? Hmm. Well, I think that was sort of um, a little bit of a, yeah, it, it was a problem for me at the beginning in the sense that I was trying to think about exactly that like what 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 was particular to London um and how to make work about it when I wasn't physically there um and you know I lived in the city for over 25 years I've only just moved out um but there is there is something particular about the city I think in relation to that very particular history of the East India Company. I'm sorry, I keep going back to that. Um, but for me, I guess that's sort of the route of and the journey that I've been on. Um, so yeah, I feel like there's something, it's something to do with that for me. Um, yeah, another scattered answer, but it's something very much to do with um, uh, that that particular company, which started off in this little tiny office in in London, and just you know ended up running India, um, which I just think is extraordinary. Um, yeah, so I don't know if that's an answer again, but um, I think about things really slowly, and I think I'll be thinking about a lot of like, and I I, I also kind of. Um, process material really slowly. So I know that um, all of this will, will be like um, playing on my mind probably for the rest of the week. <laughs> and then I'll have an answer. <laughs> Thanks, Sheila. I think one, one of the, oh, sorry, um, Deborah, you want to come in? Yeah, just one thing that came into my mind where like thinking about this question is this idea of global consequences. And so in the same way that when we were trying to figure out actually how the monsoon work and why the, like, like actually the mechanism of it, we kind of came across this idea of a tilt in the orbit that creates global changes in temperature and in, and in weather. In the same way, I think, what are the global consequences of the role of London and the UK um, historically with the, and, and the history of that part of the world? So all the colonial past and, and, and that. So I think that really came into my mind, this idea of uh, um, small acts or small um, 
no, they're not even small acts, but uh, small actions or like one scale of action and global consequences. And the global consequences of uh, us being here and, and talking about um, this work and having people in the room that come from different parts of the world. So I think that really resonates me, with me. And I remember um, me and Nina uh, in another type of work that we were doing, um, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, we did this visit of the London Docks um, at the London Museum of the Dockland. And, and again, how all of that history is so present and so layers, not only um, just for the kind of colonial past, but also in the, finan the financial present or presence of uh, uh, London on the kind of left, the, the financial world. So I think, yeah, this idea of global consequences really come back to me. Mm. Yeah, no, fascinating. Um, uh, Beth Cullen has a question. Just... Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for your wonderful work. It's been incredible to watch um, today. It's yeah, been really amazing. And I just wondered, I'm just thinking about, you know, I feel like the, the project team kind of went on such a massive journey and our kind of understanding of the monsoon from when we kind of first started to, you know, working through it. Um, and I just wondered whether you could maybe share how going through this kind of creative process has maybe made you think about or understand or relate to the monsoon differently from, from when you started. Um, so I'm just just thinking of an example. Um, I before this project, I worked for um, in Ethiopia in East Africa, and I'd never really thought of it as a monsoonal region before. And suddenly, when you know, when we were doing this process of kind of really learning what the monsoon is and how it works and its mechanisms, I think that understanding of kind of interconnections between places kind of blew my mind. And I just <laughs> I just wondered if you could maybe share. Um, some of the, the journeys that you've been on in terms of um, monsoonal thinking. Nina, do you want to respond? Thanks, Beth. I think similarly, I had that like, whoa, it's all connected moment, um, which, yeah, it, as you say, it, it's really quite, it makes me feel very small and that there's this huge thing that's happening and it knows about it and we don't. But I think all of us went through a similar process, especially when Deborah was trying to work out like, how can you explain what the monsoon is? And one day we all arrived into our Zoom room and we were like, it's the wind, it's not the rain. And, and you know, I still hang on to that and suddenly, like the weather became much more interesting to me somehow because wind is more fascinating and confounding than this kind of stereotypical idea of lots of rain is. And that, I mean, I don't wanna speak for all of us, but that was really significant to me. And I feel like has just shifted my whole perspective on the monsoon entirely. I think for me, I just, um, I think when I heard that question as well of um, how is, London a monsoonal city I was really confounded um, because I just didn't associate London or England with the monsoon at all um, and also my own memories of the monsoon were just a few um, from like 30 20 30 40 years ago of being in the monsoon I thought what has this got to do with me here now in Leicester um, and so I went on a journey from these really fragmented um, almost sepia print memories in my in my mind um, all the way into sort of my lived experience today where I literally see the monsoon everywhere around my home now and um, you know and it's become a discussion point over dinner um, with the kids and it's just you know every time I go out to hang my laundry out I'm I'm more conscious and mindful of the wind and how it speaks to me and how I'm part of it. All of that sort of, it's sort of meshed into my everyday life. So it's gone from something very, very far away and distant into something that I'm breathing in um, sort of on a daily basis. I think it's probably because of the intensity of this project, but um, I think it will, it will stay with me. Thanks. Liza, do you want to comment on that? Um, yes, thank you. Um, uh, Lindsay said something uh, which um, 
was really great and helped me in the beginning. Um, she was speaking about how this, at some point, this project changed for her in terms of thinking about Dhaka, Chennai, Yangon, John, in, in, as cities, um, as, as, as a monsoon inside those cities. And it's, it changed when she thought, thought about um, the city within the monsoon. And so I think, you know, a lot of, um, you know, looking through the platform and really kind of immersed in it for quite a few days, I, I thought about those methodologies and the research that, that had been put together over these years. Um, and I thought about, you know, London as, as a smaller entity within a larger body. Um, and I, I take it kind of more metaphorically as well. I mean, I, I'm thinking very much about the granular and the kind of physical. Um, I walked along the river and I just kind of, you know, kind of tried to get a sense of the ground around me. Um, but at the same time, I think, you know, it's definitely shifted my perception of, of, of seeing a kind of larger force of elements, which is not just about um, climate and, um, you know, sort of um, uh, things outside our bodies. Um, and in a sense, again, the platform of Monsoon and Multiplicity has brought that together because you really see the entanglement of community, people, you know, the making of bricks, how the clay is formed, every single thing actually is integrated to this system, uh, which is much bigger than, than, you know, what we imagine it to be. So, yeah, just a really large, expansive thing, which I, again, yeah, think about London through that system as well, <clears throat> of how many kind of layers of, um, you know, integrated kind of conversations and narratives exist, yeah. Yeah, no, that's really that's really interesting because I know because you, you work a lot with maps and you talked about the difference between representation and actually experiencing things. And, I, and now you talked about how um, monsoonal multiplicities has introduced this whole new layer of, of entanglements and um, material qualities. Do, do you think that might um, um, unfold new areas of of, of work? I think it's. Um, I think it's kind of um, the the first thing I would say is that it establishes a relationship between myself and London in a very different way to what it was previously. Um, I can't define that yet, but it certainly uh, gives me a kind of a gateway to enter London. You know, from a different perspective. Um, London is 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 just a city, but you know, I'm talking about many different things. Um, and I think also just digging into archives here is going to kind of um, offer lots of possibilities for work. So, you know, ideas that are generating, it's, just, it's not going to stop. Yeah. Great. I know uh, we have, we've got a um, few more minutes and I, as part of the agenda, we were quite keen to just um, bring in discussion around, I know we have talked, talked about this a bit, but uh, brainstorming or exploring other possible consequences with the work. And um, I know you know, Lindsay framed um, the, the residents um, partly, well, just you know, raised the question of how, how can science, cartography and ethnography and creative practice address climate change or just thinking about how the, the monsoonal assemblies Assemblages project um, can engage more with artists. Um, and maybe Lindsay might want to come in at this point as well, um, just to kind of elaborate on, on that. But, well, neither do you want to respond? Thanks, Irina. Sorry, Thanks, yeah. Irina. Mm. Um, well, you know, th thank you. I mean, I don't really have any particular vision for how to take this forward, but I, I, if I could just reflect on the extraordinary work that this provocation has produced already, and I'm thinking I'm hearing from all the artists that this has sparked something which, which is definitely going to go further. So 
we can probably engage with in much more outside of this forum as to how that might be possible. But could I could I just take the floor while I've got the floor? Just answer. Um, I'd like to just answer something uh, Harsha's question a little bit. That what I find has been so productive about this process is the different ways that people have have tackled the question. Um, from Sheila's one extraordinary question, which I just loved: How long does it take the air? of the monsoon to blow from India to London. So, so the question was very material, literally in that sense, how is London a monsoon or city? It's the air. Or the more kind of historical research, and I'm reminded of, of um, Dilipta Kuna's insistence that, that history is in the present, history is in the material, history is in the streets of land, it's not in the past, it's it's right here, which and um, which with both she and Niza seem to have picked up. And then what I see about about feedback theatre's amazing work is just this idea, and it's present in all of your work, of the monsoon having changed the way we think about our present, and you know just becoming so much aware uh, i mean so so the monsoons changed london for us in a way and i think the project team will will concur that it's certainly changed the way that we are being in the city and being in our lives um and and finally just to answer lizzie sell's question i don't think we belong to the weather i think we are the weather um in so many ways um the weather weathers us and we we actually are the weather <clears throat> Thanks. Thank, thank you, Lindsay. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think it would be. Oh, sorry, Nizo, do you want no, to respond to that? I was, yeah. I was just clapping for the. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think it would be. Nina has proposed that um, we get some response from the audience. To, um, can be yeah. doesn't have to be questions. It can just be um, just a, a kind of bodily response or a emotive response. Karina, can I say something? I see our friends from the Maldives are in the audience. Yeah, yeah. Ishan, Uifam, you've written something in the chat box. Don't you want to bring it to the floor? Ishan, have you dropped off? Or is it? Oh. Mm. Because I think it was comment. <laughs> yeah, it's a lovely comment. Yeah. Hello, Anne. Yeah, Ishan, we can hear you. It's it's actually from here. I was using Ishan's phone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can't seem to put my camera on. So, but yeah, but you 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 were discussing um the the word monsoon. And uh, I was just thinking about it, so just commented it that way. No, it's it's a lovely comment. How do you pronounce it? I think in in in, uh, in Arabic. I'm trying to find the camera here because I'm on the phone. Okay. Sorry about that. Don't worry. Can anyway. I Anyway, uh, yeah, the, the word uh, mausam is uh, in Hindi and Persian or Arabic, right? I think. Yeah. Because we <laughs> watch, is it? And here we call it mausam, which, which basically means weather. So the southwest uh, monsoon and the northeast monsoon, which is like two, two mausams for us. So I was I was thinking when we were uh, when I was listening to what you were all, what you all were saying that um, we are maybe trying to trying to talk about the weather or just trying to talk about something from a totally different perspective. It could be what we are trying to do. Yeah, that, like, that's a, thank you. That's a lovely addition, um, and it's great that you've joined us from from the Maldives. Because I know that was one, one of the research areas for the um, Air March design um, group. It was a field trip. Um, Haida has joined us as well. Haida Devachi. Um, Haida, do you want to add any, any 
I know you've been working with the artists, but any responses? Can I ask, um, do any of the artists want to add um, anything else you know, in terms of um, exploring the work in, in the future? Um, maybe different collaborations, Deborah? Just very quickly. Uh, well, one thing that actually um, yeah, we want just to remind um, everyone here is that um, is about this effort in mapping <laughs> all of our um, reaction and perception of weather. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna put again the link in the chat for <laughs> you all to link and kind of go on the Google form. Um, but I think uh, personally as well on this question is that what will be uh, very interesting. I don't know if it will be possible, but uh, having seen the wonderful work of the other artists as well, I think uh, I think my dream will be to be able to be uh, probably even in a room together and actually being able to kind of work together with all that we come up with will be a very um, interesting way of like pull these similar threads and and working. Uh, further with that, that would be fantastic. But um, I'm also plugging that Google form in the <laughs> chat so that we can create a bigger map. Thank you. Thanks, Deborah. I'm just going to bring in Nina, and then there's a question from Susanna in the audience. I just wanted to say, I think this way of working in response to such a huge body of research is something I I really think should be thought about, and and has been so useful for our process. Sheila's spoken a lot about like the slowness of making, which we as a company have, you know, definitely experienced. And this initial kind of research, gathering together the things you want to be surrounded by before you actually start pulling things out, takes us a huge amount of time and, and just in an almost unsustainable way. And so being able to shortcut that um, has been a, you know, it's, been quite eye-opening to go, ah, oh, we don't actually have to do this all ourselves necessarily. We can use other bodies of work um, to spark things for us. And I, I just want to say what a great opportunity that it's been to be offered that. Um, and it, yeah, I think it will change our practice going forward, you know, forever maybe. Yeah, no, that, that's a great comment. Because um, I know you, you've all just worked on the project for, is it two and a half weeks? I think roughly. Yeah. So, um, Nisa, you want to come in there? No, I would just second that, uh, what Nina just said. I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, you know, research is a really important part of my process. And having the information of uh, five years of research by monsoonal multiplicities and the whole project of Manas. Um, and, and really um, engaging with different kinds of knowledge pools was very um, exciting because, you know, you've got the scientific imaginary and then you've got the very lived experience of people uh, all kind of colliding together in that space. Um, and, and it's such a compression. Um, so to engage with that was, was incredible. And I continue, I'm definitely going to continue to, to sort of you know, jump into that and and learn from it and and kind of be inspired. Yeah, Sheila, do you just want do you want to add one comment and then um, I'll just bring in Susanna's question and then um, I'll close the the session. Yeah, um, I think I actually said to Sue Palmer, my collaborator, I feel like um, this website has just done so much of our research for us. <laughs> in the sense that like it's extraordinary and there's stuff in there that we wouldn't have necessarily had time to come across or um, do ourselves because we're about to make our next piece about atmosphere and so it feels amazing and um, just the language and the approach and the connection one of the things that me and C uh, joked about throughout making common salt was everything is connected that was our phrase and also by the way that project was made over seven years um, maybe longer um, but everything is everything is connected um, and that was the thing we were really struck by but still when approaching the question in what ways is London a monsoonal city? Initially, I definitely found it hard 
to get into a way of thinking. So that really teaches me something that even though I understand that everything is connected, that still there's this kind of uh, compartmentalization that sort of happens. And yeah, I had to slip back in. I had to remind myself again, like uh, about that, that slightly different, that different way of thinking. Um, so yeah. But I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen with the work necessarily that I made, whether it will turn into um, performance or whether it will just exist as photographs. It feels like process. Yeah. So thank you, Sheila. Um, I'm free. We're just two minutes from finishing. So sorry, 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 Susanna, not to get your question in there. I'm just aware that um, um, it's it's quite a generous session. So apologies for that. Um, I just wanted to finish um, by saying that um, the final event to close the exhibition um, will be on Monday, March the 29th at one o'clock. And um, the artist Haidar Devachi will be premiering um, a short film which um, aims to capture the inspiration behind each of the artists uh, or sorry, and group work, um, their vision and thought as a project developed from idea to realization. So yeah, there, there's the date, so do, log on to that. And um, part of the commission um, from uh, Sunday the 11th of April, um, each artist's work will be posted over six days on the Monas um, Instagram feed, which is Monas under slash um, 16. So um, do um, log on to that. So I just want to thank all the artists um, for, for sharing all their, their work today. And thank you for all um coming on online okay thank you very much thank you